stocks, bonds, ETFs, straight out of downtown Chicago. This is Zach's Market Edge. Welcome to Zach's Market Edge, the podcast about investing in your life. I'm your host, Tracy Reinick. And this week, I'm joined by Zach's stock strategist and the editor of Zach's Commodity Innovators newsletter, Jeremy Mullen, who's been on the show before, and he's back to talk about commodities. Of course, that's his expertise, or at least one of them. Welcome, Jeremy. Hey, thanks for having me again. Okay, so this is a new world kind of for commodities it's about the one year anniversary of the start of the ukraine war which really threw just about all commodities in a loop last year we had some 10-year highs in a lot of commodities as a result of that war and then those have all come down pretty dramatically off of those highs as uh, all the markets, commodity markets, are now adjusting to what is going on over in Ukraine and what kind of impacts that is having on various commodities. And then we had the sanctions on Russia. That's also impacting on various commodities. And now we've had China getting rid of its zero COVID policy and reopening and what impacts those may have on some commodities. So there's a lot going on. That's why I wanted to have Jeremy on this week to talk about it because it seems a little bit uh, all over the place. <laughs> and I wanted to just start with oil because that was one of the ones that spiked on the Ukraine war, went up to like decade highs of a little bit over 130 a barrel on WTI, I think it was at the highs. But it's come down WTI eight months in a row now. And then we have the other energy commodity, natural gas. It was supposed to go to these, you know, sky high prices this winter, but it never got cold enough, at least not in the US or Europe. And the prices have come way down and are at like multi decade lows on natural gas instead of going the other way. So, Jeremy, what's what is the story with? Uh, oil in particular, let's start with that one. It has come back down into the 70s. I know you and I were kind of discussing this before the podcast a little bit, and I feel like we're at kind of a you know inflection point with WTI. It's kind of been hanging out between 72 and 83, but I feel a little bit like it could break down into the 60s, but I'm I'm wondering what you think about what's going on with oil. Yeah, I I think uh, we're in agreement that we're kind of like in this short term bearish environment. The charts don't look good for oil. Um, you know, what is also scary for anybody long, they look at what nat natural gas did um, since the beginning of the year. And it's like, whoa, can can something similar um, happen in oil where it just kind of uh, flushes down? And that's yeah. kind of what I'm looking for. Um, you know, there's a lot. Everybody's been bullish, very bullish over the last year for all the fundamental reasons that are out there and we kind of discussed with low supply and that all started with um the uh invasion right so it's been a wild year uh almost exactly a year now and that whole trade with the invasion has been unwound in many many places um like i mentioned natural gas but uh wheat as well uh wheat yeah. spiked in a very similar fashion and has come all the way back to pre-invasion prices and looks pretty weak if you look at that chart. But um, focus on oil, uh, you know, there's still a lot of reasons to be bullish and I do get that. You mentioned the China reopening, yeah. um, but a lot of uncertainty and questions around that. But when you're just looking at the chart of oil and trying to take these, this, I think the arguments on the fundamental side are very valid to the bullish and even the bears. They can make their points, but if you look at these charts, it's very weak. Um, we had a nice spike up uh, today on uh, that on some China news. Basically, there's some mobility readings um, that that say things are ticking up. But you know, under the 50-day, under the 200, um, it's just slowly slumping down. And I think what a lot of people why it's hanging on to here in the in the mid 70s is a lot of people are front running the SPR bid. So okay. we all know that uh, the SPR sold about 20 to 30 points higher 
and they have to reload. So everybody knows this, right? And so what happens now, is- Hold on a minute. Has, Explain what the SPR is for people who are listening yeah, the to Yeah, Strategic it. Petroleum <laughs> Reserve, which is basically okay. our country's reserve of oil. And okay. um, when, when they want to, basically when prices are low, they try to reload this reserve with as much oil as possible for emergency needs. And then when it's higher, it's a way to kind of manipulate price to get things in. And that's what uh, the administration has done over the last few months. So um, prices have come in, you know, that's worked in combination with higher interest rates and just uh, kind of a slumping in demand. Um, but, you know, if, if you look at that chart, if you look at future crude oil, oil prices, we're still in backwardation and we have been for almost a year. And what that means is when the current uh, price, the current spot price is, a, is above the futures contract prices. So if you look to, and I got the chart up here, I'm gonna look to December, of 2023, you can buy for just under $75 when it's at 77 now. So what's gonna happen if we do get this flush we're talking about? Let's say we break 70. The US government is not gonna come in and support those spot prices. They're gonna let it fall and they're going to get into those future contract prices, will be, which will be lower. So they could get into the $65 area for the futures contract while the price is still you know, hanging around. 70. So that's kind of an interesting dynamic that I'm watching if okay. oil does uh, kind of flush out as I <laughs> used earlier. I know that there's been some more M&A activity on the oil side, and that is usually happens when, you know, you get the weakness in the shares and still there's still some bullish fundamentals there. So the companies are like, eh, I see a buying opportunity here. So a Canadian energy company called Baytex Energy, I think they trade in Toronto. They yeah. uh, put a bid in for Ranger Oil, which is a U.S. energy. The ticker there is ROCC. It's a $2.5 billion dollar. Um, offer there. And then there are a lot of rumors. Bloomberg has reported that Pioneer Natural Resources, PXD, one of the big shale players, they have been acquiring over the last couple of years, but that they may be interested in natural gas um, producer range resources. RRC is the ticker there, but there's been no confirmation. We're just hearing some rumors going on out there, but yeah. all these stocks are cheap. So do you expect to see some more m a off of this or you know if they break down further or are you expecting some of these oil stocks not just the oil to break down yeah i definitely do um so we have seen the xle come in a little bit but i think any kind of dip is going to be an opportunity as i said short term i'm kind of bearish but i think there's nice five-year play here in a lot of these names and this m a is going to be definitely a reason why um you know it's funny you, those two stocks have very similar tickers rocc versus rcc right don't they i had to look it up to make sure i'm like what what is this one what is that one yeah <laughs> yeah so um yeah it's, it's, that's a smaller deal it's only 2.5 billion for rocc um yeah. it's eagle four play um i do think the reason that uh Latex did that is they are looking to just expand on their free cash flows. And so a lot of these oil companies have these cash reserves and they can buy back shares or they can uh, pay a big dividend or they can do this M&A. And I think we've seen the, pre the prior to the buybacks and the dividends and we're going to start seeing these M&A, especially if we continue to see like oil come in a little bit, prices come in a little bit. And it uh, the Ranger is er is pretty interesting. They just had earnings and you know, record free cash flow, reduced their debt by over 1 billion. And now but in the prep you you, had, you asked me to look at this one and I looked into it and I saw a quote by the CEO for Range. And I want you to listen to this. It says, "Range is the strongest position in company history. We're excited about the opportunity to develop Range's world-class inventory over the coming decades into a growing market for natural gas and natural liquids." So to me, that kind of sounds like someone who doesn't want to sell that's looking forward right, right. you know what i mean that's the pioneer that's the pioneer uh, yeah that was the pioneer yeah. Runner, right yeah so i don't yeah, know yeah. about that one <laughs> okay um yeah i mean pioneer you know they they aren't as big in natural gas so it is a little bit curious that they are seeking out like a natural gas player at this time i feel 
and range is a, is a very volatile. I, I'm always watching that one for commodity innovators, and I can never pull the trigger. It's it's moves a lot, but um, you know, good earnings. I I I like the stock long here, um, and if it is getting more interest, obviously, just another reason to own it. What about some of the other natural gas players? Uh, you know, I used to own Comstock in the Insider Trader, but then when the natural gas was just crashing there, I had to get out of it. Yeah. Um, it's C C R K is the ticker for that one, and then you know Shenery or whatever they are, the big guys. Yeah, LNG, Shenery. Yeah. yeah. They yeah. uh thirty eight billion dollar market cap on that one. I like it. I think it's one of the best in breathe. It did have a little pullback here to some technical levels. I okay. almost added that one, but uh, with natural gas uh, in in the free fall, I kind of I, I really thought it was going to go a lot lower. But it's held okay. up okay. Um, Comstock, yeah, the chart's looking a bit more rough. But there's other names like yeah. Apache, and uh, that's APA and FANG. Um, you know, did a quick look at all those um, this morning, and looking at the Zach's rank, they're all in the threes. Yeah, and I've noticed this with a lot of oil names. You're not getting a lot of earnings estimates going up. So um, there's definitely analysts are seeing some short term issues with falling oil prices here and that bottom line. Um, For sure. So I would sure. I wouldn't rush into any of these names while natural gas has uh, bounced back a little bit. I really see kind of this sideways like trade around two uh, going forward. Usually when natural gas falls like this, it takes a while before that story to to change. So we'll okay. see. But yeah, if you want if you want a natural gas play, I like LNG out of all of those. OK, uh, let's switch over to copper because this is supposed to be the smart metal. <laughs> Dr. Copper it's supposed to be yeah. telling us where the economy is going. It too spiked during Ukraine war and is down off those highs. But I haven't looked at it for a while. To, I'm just in full disclosure. I used to follow it very closely and I haven't looked at it in at least a year. So I was surprised to see it above four dollars still. It's at it was at 408 when I just looked and that's. That's not low for sure, considering what, what it has been at over the last like 10 years, much lower than that. Um, but what is going on with copper? Is it signaling anything or what? what is happening? Yeah, I mean, it's it looks good. I look, fundamentally, it, it with China reopening, there's many reasons to be long this now. Um, okay. And then when you everything you read long term, there's going to be a supply issue with copper down the road. So right. uh, this might be like a, more of a macro five to ten year kind of reason why copper prices are holding up. They did fall to that three, um, what, what was it, three ten area? And I, I was looking at that chart this morning. You know, I like the Fibonacci retracements. That was a sixty one point eight percent retrace, and we slowly grinded back over the four dollar area, which is basically where we were for most of twenty twenty one. So it's kind of found its price. Um, but I like this long term chart. Uh, it's very China dependent. And, y you know, we have the it was the PMI, uh, the China PMI is out tomorrow. Okay. And will affect price. So I would watch if you're a copper follower, uh, watch how that Chinese economic headlines affect price. And I think that's going to be um, the rebound in China is going to be uh, very determined. will determine whether this gets back up to the, that five dollar level or not. But I could see it flatlining uh, for the rest of the year, especially with you know recession fears. Okay, but even if it's you know kind of hanging around that four dollar level, that's still pretty good news for the copper producers, like Freeport. Oh yeah, for the stocks. Yeah, exactly. and, and Southern Copper. So are those buys here? What's going on with those? Yeah, those charts look good. I Southern Copper looks really strong. Um, it might be because of the dividend uh, is a lot better than Freeport. Yeah. Yeah, like a five percent dividend versus maybe a one percent. I'm not sure. Freeport. Yeah, it's one it's, and a half at Freeport. Yeah, it's much. I, I did notice because I looked at the dividends and I right. was like, oh, this is a big and, difference. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Freeport did have a, a pullback since earnings. I, you know, they had a nice beat. Um, I think it was just profit taking after a big move. But they've also okay. had so they're kind of global versus Southern, where Southern is mostly in uh, South America, and uh, uh, FCX had. Production issues in Peru with the civil unrest that was going on there. They had flooding in Indonesia, okay. so wow. 
they had some issues. And if you're looking for a spot for Freeport, technically, I like that um, the mid 30s, uh, 35, if you can get it on any kind of market pullback. Um, okay. But, you know, you look at the chart for uh, Southern Copper SEO, it's it's not pulling back. The thing looks no. very strong. Another yeah. uh, positive that Southern has over FCX is the uh, volatility of the stock. The beta for Southern is 1.2 versus FCX, which is two. FCX is very, very volatile. So um, you're getting less of a dividend for a volatile name. Um, it might be a better trading stock than an investing stock. So uh, depending on how you want to approach that market, you can kind of determine what, what your choice would be. Yeah, that's a good point. I've owned FCX, I believe in both my insider trader and in the value investor. And we we just got crushed on it in the value investor. We had to get out because it was just too volatile. It was all yeah, over. Yeah, so I believe I was in there. Um, maybe it was in last, maybe it was last year. Yeah. Or it was year before. I don't know, but we had a similar situation where it just went too far against us. It's 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 a tricky... It's a tricky market, no doubt. Okay, so Freeport ticker is FCX. Southern Copper is S, as in Sam, CCO, SCCO. Um, let's switch over, sticking on the metals, over to steel, because I was kind of surprised that you were telling me before the podcast that Cleveland Cliffs, ticker CLF, is one of your favorites on the steel side. So why is that? Yeah, so uh, if you're asking me for a longer term, it's definitely one of the more interesting names. Uh, I would say like the best in breed is is Nucor, um, okay. and you can see what that's done lately. I had a good quarter, but I just think I find Cleveland Cliffs very interesting. They transformed their business over the last couple of years. They bought ArcelorMittal and AK Steel, and what they have done is they is taken their focus off of mining iron ore because that's all they used to really be, and now they're this vertically integrated steel producer. Um, now they just had earnings and they beat by 9%, but missed on revenues. Now they are rising, raising prices. And one of the interesting things about this company, they set their contracts ahead of time. So the end, they basically lock in contracts. So the end result of this is they are less affected by volatile swings of the steel spot prices in the, in the market. And so um, that really helps take away that volatility in some some of those. I mean, look at what Nucor did earlier in the year when it fell from like 150 to almost 100. I was long that one in commodity of theirs and it got us. Yeah. Um, so basically like looking over the last couple quarters, like, you know, you look at these, their call for Cleveland Cliffs. They say that when steel prices were falling, they achieved substantially higher selling prices because of these fixed contracts. So entering 2023, their fixed prices of contracts have reset higher. Their unit costs are continuing to decline and their sales volume is improving. So they are looking forward to like 2023 and saying uh, their quarterly adjusted EBITDA should improve uh, progressively. And they think that the the fourth quarter of 2022 is like an inflection, a turning point of their profitability. So there's a lot to look forward to coming up in this year. and. Especially after EPS, you look at this chart, it's held up well. It's almost it did sell off after the numbers, but it's almost back to its pre-earnings price. And I was actually looking to add this one um, in commodity innovators. It got down to 19. I had an alert at 18, and I'm now I'm scared I missed it. So right. I, I might have to chase this one. But this is a this is a definitely interesting name just because of how they've uh, changed the business um, over the last couple of years. Now, do you recommend people if they aren't in any of these do what you just said and like chase into them or or should no, they No, you know me I like the, the counter strike portfolio is all about buying the dips and you yeah. know I carry that over into the commodity uh, portfolio as well but okay. if I see something that looks really good and it's like especially on the technical side and I like the fundamental story and I don't think I'm gonna get my price I will uh, definitely, uh, uh, you know, just forget about buying that dip and get in. So, okay. um, you know, if it gets to new yearly highs, which is only, I'm looking at the chart now, a buck and a half away, there's a good chance that it'll continue to run. Um, right, right. So if I see it approaching that $22 level, 
might be time for commodity innovators to just bite the bullet and get in. Right, right. Uh, that's a little bit different sentiment, I feel, than what we were seeing last year. Obviously, the overall markets were very weak, so people were scared to chase anything because they just assumed it would, you know, it would dip at some point and they would be able to get in there. Exactly. But it seems and that like that's still there, right? We yeah, still have okay. that here. Okay. Um, you can see it in the intraday trading. Um, we're seeing, you know, big moves up and down. Um, but when, when you take a step back and look at the, the charts of some of these names, they, they do look really good. All right. Leaving some of the metals, I did want to talk about chicken because it is like on the commodity side. And you were telling me that there's an interesting story going on with chicken wings in particular and Wingstop, which obviously sells the wings. It's, it is ticker W-I-N-G. And what is going on there with the chickens? I know we have the chickens with the egg issue, but I wasn't paying attention to what's going on with the actual chickens. Yeah, this is one of my favorite stories. You know, the commodity newsletter is called Commodity Innovator. So I'm always looking for, you know, something that's different than just simply buying oil and gold and yeah. those stocks, right? Um, so uh, I noticed this, uh, you know, it, the stock a absolutely plummeted in the, in the middle of 2022. Um, and it rebounded and now, I had why, an eye why on was it. was that though? Was that a Ukraine thing too, or a concern about, you know, chicken supplies or was that well, an that, inflationary? I fears? think it was just more market sympathy. It was kind okay. of just, so actually let me, let me, I want to talk about the valuation later, but that was kind of valuation store. You know, this like everything yeah. that had of a high valuation was just crushed. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll talk more about this, but like Wingstop's valuation is pretty high. Um, but I start when it started to come back, so it fell from what to 180 to to 80, and then when it started to come back over 100, 120, I started to notice the strength. I'm like, what is going on with this? So I started digging, and uh, I think they had a quarter where they um, the CEO commented on the year over year deflationary aspect of bone in wings. And when I found out exactly what was going on, I added it to commodity innovators at 120. Basically. I still saw this unique story, which I think a lot of people just ignored. Um, and basically, it's that the boning, the bone in wing segment. So you know the wings that have the bones in them, not yeah. the the boneless, which a lot of people love. Uh, they saw record low prices when they reported in July. They they called it meaningful deflation with wings down forty percent year over year. Now the wow. reasoning is interesting and confusing, but. Basically, is demand has collectively shifted to boneless, which is actually from the chicken breast. It's not like they have the chicken wings and they take the bones out of them and give them to you. It's actually just the chicken breast, right? So the cost know. of chickens did go up, but the actual wings plummeted in price. Okay. So wings, they just continue to see sales growth and within that category of bone and wings. And their margins were really helped by that dynamic. So yeah. with everyone struggling with inflation. Last year, deflation was a tailwind for Wingstop. So okay. very interesting dynamic there. And if you look over the last couple quarters, they just crushed it because their costs went down instead of up. Yeah, that's very unusual right now out there. Yeah. Now, I did dig into the last quarter. Uh, they had earnings a couple um, weeks ago, and the stock did hit all-time highs. And they did comment that they do expect unfavorable movement of those record low prices in the bone and wings. But they actually think that the, it'll be offset by the chicken breast prices, which are coming in. So <laughs> they might okay. have best of both worlds here, right? Um, the recent quarter was 35% EPSB, 8.7 same store sales growth. Um, Wedbush called them the best growth story in restaurants, which is a nice compliment. But yeah. I'll get back to valuation. 91 forward PE. So wow. You tell me as the value investor if you like that. <laughs> it's a little too pricey for me. They've right. always but here's been my expensive. point on that. And you're gonna have a lot of people trying to short the name on that. I get it. Um, but when you see a stock trading all time highs when the valuation is still high and everybody knows it, um, usually the market's telling you that it's gonna grow into that valuation. I'm not sure you can find a similar scenario like that 
over the last year in this kind of market atmosphere that a stock is trading at all-time highs like that. It's screaming like something positive is happening here and that they're going to grow into this valuation. Uh, another stock I can think of that has nothing to do with com commodities is Palo Alto PNW. Had this insane valuation uh, for the last couple of years. Finally, they're going into you know that that valuation in the stock is uh, approaching all time highs. It's just it's a similar kind of scenario regarding the valuation. But okay. um, obviously, if they were to miss on a quarter and this growth were to stop, the stock would plummet. So just be on the lookout for something like that. What are they saying about the like labor costs and all of that? Is that under control or it must well, be? If you know, I haven't seen any real commentary on that. I think it's a natural thing in the restaurant industry. But these costs are uh, grossly offsetting that. Um, yeah. But yeah, they. You look at you look through the commentary. Um, they don't discuss much of that at all. Um, but obviously, that's a that's a concern with every restaurant right now. So that's a, a good sure. point to bring up and watch. I do know. I I tried Wingstop for the first time during the pandemic um, because they were offering free delivery. And so I was like, well, I'm going to try this, right? Because everybody were just stuck at home. And I ordered it several times, but then they got rid of the free delivery. <laughs> so then I, I could walk to one, but I was like, ah. um, but I, I do feel like, you know, the ease of the delivery. And then they were doing ghost kitchens as well, because what do you care where you're getting it from? Most people don't eat inside the wing stop. It's all mostly delivery or, you know, pickup. So why not have some ghost uh, kitchens and deliver it even faster? So that seemed to be working for them too. Yeah, I like the Wingstop stories, but as the value investor at 91 times, I'm right. a little bit gun shy there. Um, but again, you you do have always paid more for Wingstop because of its growth trajectory. It is one of the fastest growers of the restaurant industry right now. So yeah, and has. I've only had it once too. And okay. it was okay, but I prefer okay. my uh, local bar and grill around here that has uh, good wings. So just full disclosure, I'll be going. There. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I do feel like the wing stop fries are good too, actually. So I was into those even more so than the wings, you but know, another, and it does depend on which type of like the wing thing you get, like, you know, so you have to, you do have to try, I, I did order it multiple times to try the various ones. Right. Another thing I should bring up is their chicken sandwich. So, oh, they got a new chicken sandwich, and it is. Um, I guess it's just selling out wherever it is. You know how Popeyes had a chicken sandwich is really hot. Apparently, this one's yeah. pretty good. I'm starting to see. I, they, I think they debuted that uh, about four, four to six months ago. Okay. It was on their, I they talked about it on their last earnings, and um, apparently, you know, it, it's doing very well. So that's something to look out to, they're expanding their menu. Um, now that obviously we're getting away from what we were talking about, about the, the deflationary aspect. Um, right. But it, the point is, is that there's a lot of growth here in a unique yeah. kind of commodity name. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, is there anything else you feel like you should or really want to talk about in the commodity space that we didn't already cover? Because there's plenty more other commodities that we haven't even touched on, but I'm throwing it over to you. If there's some area like that you feel everyone who's listening right now must know about. Sure. Um, you know, I, I'll just run through a couple ideas. Uh, I noticed gold uh, popping today. Um, uh, gold's an interesting story here. As soon as rates turn, as soon as the Fed stops and, you know, that keeps on being pushed back. I think gold and the miners have a run. We just recently entered a couple in innovators. Um, I might be a little early to that. I'll admit that, okay. but um, I I kind of like that in the back half of the year. Um, grains, um, interesting spot here. We got planting season coming up. If the planting season is pretty su successful, you're probably going to see those come in a bit. Um, and I'll add one thing. I mentioned wheat and the price coming down the pre-invasion, natural gas coming down to pre-invasion, crude oil basically right here. Um, I would be concerned and in the initial price reaction if there is some kind of end to the conflict in uh, Ukraine. I know everybody's initial reaction yeah. is be like, oh, that's the rhetoric is not heading towards that at all. But you never know. There could be right. some 
some kind of ceasefire or something. The market seems to be telling you that they're not scared at all of Russia and Ukraine and the supply uh, disruptions it created early, early last year. So right. what I'm trying to say is uh, prepare yourself for, for something like that in case you wake up and there's a ceasefire uh, or or whatever it may be. You know, may, maybe this goes on for uh, 10 years and we we have a, you know, like a North Korea, South Korea situation and it's just some kind of neutral, you know, forever war. But if there's a ceasefire, the markets are going to react to it and it, it's going to be if you're if you're long, it might be kind of scary for uh, for a week or two. Right. Um, well, that was going to be my question. So, if the, if if we do get the ceasefire or some you know kind of resolution, even um, should should I have some cash to deploy in that situation if I'm not already in some of those? Oh things? yeah, I think that would create okay. tremendous opportunity. That's when I'd be the buy the dipper. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Yeah, a hundred percent. I I think that there would be initial overreaction as people yeah. are positioned wrong. Right. Um, right. And so sure. there'll have to be some uh, washout of those positions. And then, you know, you give it some time to digest and, and reset. And then I think there'll be tremendous opportunity there. Because, you know, the other side of this, you know, if Russia, Ukraine ends, you do get that supply fix, but then you potentially have demand come back as fear fades, right? So it kind of long term would cancel each other out, in my view. That's something we would definitely will have to be watching. You have to be kind of like a global economist of some kind. Yeah, like I, I don't want to pretend I'm a geopolitical and... expert and know what's going to happen here. I don't. Yeah, you have to but know all But seeing, the seeing these prices come in, it had me thinking, well, what if the market knows something we don't? Yeah, tricky areas always, but a lot of people think commodities are going to be one of the places you might want to be this year in 2023 so it's always good to to get some insights from people like Jeremy so that we know kind of what's going on out there and also in these other areas you might not be thinking about like chickens <laughs> chicken wings <Yeah. laughs> okay let me recap a lot of the tickers we talked about because there were a lot on this episode okay so on oil we talked about pioneer natural resources i own it in the value investor and i own it in my own personal portfolio they may or may not be buying range resources which was also mentioned it's pxd for pioneer and range resources is rrc then we had Baytex Energy. They are buying Ranger Oil, which is R O C C. Can you trade Baytex on the U.S.? I don't. I'm not sure you can. Maybe on the, no. I think it's Toronto Stock Exchange. Is it just Toronto P B T E? I believe. I, I, I believe. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, but the Ranger Oil is U.S., so it's R O C C. As I said, then we mentioned. Um, APA and Diamondback. APA is just APA. That's the old Apache. I also own that in my own portfolio. And if you want to know my saga about that, go listen to the podcast about owning that thing for 20 years. Yes, it's out there. Um, then Diamondback Energy, FANG is the ticker there, the original FANG, F A N G. Then we talked about um, natural gas a little bit more, and we had Comstock, CRK. And how do you pronounce it? Shenery? Is that how Chenier. it's pronounced? Shenier. Okay. Yeah. I always get these names wrong. Everyone knows who listens to my podcast. <laughs> um, LNG is the ticker for that one. And that's Jeremy's pick on natural gas. Then we talked about copper and there's Freeport, which is FCX and Southern Copper Core, SCCO. And Southern Copper Core is the one that's a little less volatile if you're looking for, you know, just a little less volatility. Then we talked about steel with Cleveland Cliffs, Jeremy's favorite pick, CLF. But there's also New Core, of course, out there, NUE, which he calls the best in breed. Then he did mention there at the end, uh, well, we talked about Wingstop. How can we leave that one off? It's just Wing, W I N G, in the restaurant space. And then he mentioned a few of these other things. So the gold miners, you can buy an ETF with just the gold miners in there. GDX is the ticker. And then there's the junior gold miners, GDXJ, 
Um, do you have a preference, Jeremy, for the juniors versus just the overall big one, or does it matter? If, if you're looking for m more volatility, more beta, you go with the juniors. Otherwise, I would stick with the uh, with the GDX. Okay. Uh, so there's some good advice there. And I think that covers most of what we've talked about. And that's a lot of tickers. But as I said, it's it's a interesting area to be in all the commodities. And we didn't even cover a, you know, a vast majority of them. But we'll have to have Jeremy on again to talk further about what's going on. You know, maybe after we get through the summer into next fall, and I'm sure the natural gas uh, situation will be rearing its head again as we head into the next winter. But for now, um, you know, we're looking forward to what's going on in the spring and the summer, and we'll see on a lot of these pricings and what goes on. And as always, you want to be sure to subscribe so you're listening the next time Jeremy is on again. And you can get us on SoundCloud. You can get the Market Edge on Apple Podcasts. We're on Spotify. We're on Amazon Music. We're just about anywhere you can get the podcast. But be sure to get us. And I'll see you again next week with some more stocks. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.